In this video we will review some facts about overfishing. But before we start, please like this video and subscribe to our channel for future updates. Overfishing, according to scientists, is one of the most serious risks to the future of our seas. It not only threatens the extinction of numerous fish and aquatic species, but it can also cause the oceanic ecosystem to collapse. With these 40 overfishing facts, you may learn more about this menace to the natural world. Overfishing has been specifically defined by scientists. Overfishing is simply catching so many fish in a body of water that those left behind cannot reproduce sufficiently to replace those captured. This can occur in both freshwater and marine habitats, with the initial result being underpopulation. Overfishing also causes resource depletion, limited growth, and poor biomass. While fish can recover after overfishing, it is dependent on whether or not the ecology can support their recovery. Overfishing can cause an ecological shift, as scientists call it. Ecosystem shifts are sudden, large-scale, and long-term changes in an ecosystem. Scientists also refer to it as a regime change, with a regime referring to how an ecosystem is formed as well as how it functions. Typically, the loss of one or more elements of an ecosystem causes changes in the rest of the ecosystem. It could potentially lead it to collapse, although another species or element could just replace the lost part of the ecosystem. This replacement could totally alter the ecosystem's functioning, culminating in a regime shift. Overfishing of trout, for example, may allow carp to replace them as the dominant fish species in a given ecosystem. Furthermore, carp have become so dominant that trout cannot recover from overfishing or even sustain a reproductive population. Bycatch adds to overfishing as well. Bycatch is the unintended capture of other fish and aquatic species while fishing for commercial species. Because bycatch has no commercial value, fishermen normally discard it in the sea. In principle, this allows them to return to the sea, but in practice, bycatch frequently dies as a result of injury or shock from being caught in the first place. Bycatch accounts for up to 25% of all fish collected on average, and in certain situations, considerably more. Bycatch, for example, accounts for up to five times the commercial catch in shrimp fishing. This means that many fish and other animals perish for no apparent reason, adding to the environmental impact of overfishing. People have attempted to reduce bycatch. One method is to prohibit fishing in regions where bycatch is likely due to the abundance of species present. Another method includes the use of bycatch reduction devices, BRDs, which might be costly. Having said that, BRDs have been shown to reduce bycatch by 30% to 40%. Longline fishing has also been prohibited by governments due to high bycatch rates. Other governments have outright prohibited the practice of discarding bycatch. By requiring fishermen to save whatever they capture, they are also forced to consider bycatch. This, in turn, provides an incentive to avoid or limit bycatch because they cannot profit from it. However, bycatch is not always discarded. Bycatch may be sold on the market in several places, most notably Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They are typically sold at reduced costs and advertised as various seafood or even a seafood mix. In other circumstances, bycatch is crushed up and used as organic fertilizer, fish meal, or even food for fish farms. 
Bycatch is used as an ingredient in the production of fish sauce, particularly in Asian countries. Bycatch is also employed as an ingredient in the production of fish paste or fish cakes, either for home or export purposes. One type of overfishing is growth overfishing. This entails catching fish that are smaller on average than the maximum yield per fish. As a result, the overall yield per capture is lower than if the fish were caught after they had grown much larger. Scientists have advocated for limiting fishing mortality to combat growth overfishing, allowing fish left behind to grow larger. This maximizes the yield per fish, resulting in a higher overall yield per capture. Another type of overfishing is recruitment overfishing. The most prevalent type of overfishing occurs when the adult population is decreased to the point where fish cannot reproduce enough to sustain their population. Scientists and other concerned parties have advocated for a variety of measures to combat this type of overfishing. These include moratoria, quotas, and even minimum size limits, which all function by regulating biomass levels within acceptable ranges. This allows breeding populations to remain steady, preventing overall overfishing. The final type of overfishing is ecosystem overfishing. When an entire ecosystem collapses or alters as a result of overfishing, this is the most severe type of overfishing. We've already discussed the case of carp and trout, but another example is predatory fish overfishing. As their numbers decline, the population of prey fish increases dramatically. Because prey fish grow smaller than predatory fish, this can lead to overfishing. Fishermen, in particular, must make do with smaller prey fish, resulting in lower total yields. This, in turn, may force fishermen to catch more fish to compensate for the deficiency, exacerbating the overfishing situation. Overfishing has tolerable thresholds. The concept stems from economic considerations, as fishermen must make a profit and so cannot always fully adhere to minimum regulations for their field of work. One type of permissible overfishing is biological overfishing, in which overfishing simply decreases breeding rates but maintains the population steady overall. Then there's bioeconomic overfishing, which occurs when fishing is limited to the most profitable produce. Fishermen, in particular, don't necessarily capture the most fish they can, but the most fish they can profit from. Scientists have devised methods for measuring fishing capacity. It depends on whether the focus is on input or output but the outcome always seeks to indicate whether or not the fishing population remains stable. An input focus attempts to quantify fishing capacity by looking at how much money is spent to keep a fishing enterprise functioning. If more money is spent than is made, it indicates that fishing capacity has become insufficient to remain profitable. An output emphasis, on the other hand, attempts to assess fishing capacity based on the highest lucrative yield. In this situation, if fishermen stop earning more money despite catching more fish, they have reached their fishing capacity. Overfishing is addressed in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. Overfishing is specifically addressed in Articles 61, 62, and 65. Article 61 holds governments accountable for ensuring that ocean life in exclusive economic zones, EEZs, is not overexploited. The same clause requires governments to work to rehabilitate endangered species within their EEZs. Similarly, 
Article 62 states that while governments have the freedom to develop their EEZs, they must do so within the constraints set forth in Article 61. Finally, Article 65 grants coastal nations the right to take all legally permissible methods to safeguard marine mammals in the territorial seas. Overfishing has been described as a tragedy of the commons by some observers. The term, tragedy of the commons, alludes to how people who have common access to unregulated resources would not only exploit, but also deplete them out of self-interest. Originally, the word referred to how shepherds and other animal herders in the United Kingdom would leave their flocks to graze communal lands until they were depleted. Overfishing, or how fishermen decrease fishing grounds in international waters, is now being referred to as the same phrase by observers. Governments can control overfishing in a variety of ways. We've already discussed a number of them, but these are just a few of the methods governments are attempting to combat overfishing. Bag restrictions, which specify a maximum tonnage of catch fishermen can catch at any one time, are another technique. There are also limited seasons, comparable to hunting seasons on land, during which fishermen are only permitted to fish. The establishment of marine reserves and protected areas is another method of controlling overfishing by providing fish with locations to spawn and grow without danger of being caught. Subsidies for fishing may contribute to overfishing. Nations employ fishing subsidies to lower the costs that local fishermen must bear in order to sustain their livelihoods. As a result, larger catches are encouraged, market prices remain low, and local fishermen are protected from foreign competition. While subsidies have numerous economic benefits, scientists contend that they also increase overfishing. They contend that eliminating subsidies would force fishermen to focus on quality rather than quantity. Not only would this minimize overfishing, but it might also help to diversify people's meals. It would also bring competition to local marketplaces, which could have its own economic benefits. Overfishing may be mitigated by aquaculture. Simply described, aquaculture is the cultivation of fish in captivity, typically in the form of commercial fish farms. This enables the formation of new fish stocks, albeit privately held ones, as an alternative to natural ones. Because fish farms are privately owned, owners have a greater motivation to focus on quality. Fish farming began tiny and only began to flourish in the 1970s, eventually supplanting natural fishing in the 1990s. Fish farms now produce over half of the world's aquatic harvests, and that ratio is increasing. Natural fishing, on the other hand, has remained consistent during the same time period. Many scientists now believe that aquaculture will eventually replace natural fishing and, with it, overfishing. Some skeptics argue that aquaculture cannot prevent overfishing. They specifically point out how farming carnivorous fish continues to have a negative impact on the natural ecosystem. Salmon farming, in particular, is based on feeding captive salmon fish meal and oil derived from wild prey fish. Critics also point to the practice of releasing captive salmon into the wild to supplement smaller salmon populations. This raises competition for naturally bred salmon while also harming the environment. Consumer education may also aid in the reduction of overfishing. This has resulted in movements opposing eating seafood entirely or only eating sustainable seafood.
buying farm seafood or from merchants known to have programs geared at sustaining or even expanding fish stocks at sea is the latter. The Marine Stewardship Council, MSC, and Friend of the Sea are two organizations notable for certifying sustainable seafood. Google has its own campaign to educate consumers on overfishing. Global Fishing Watch was founded in 2016 in collaboration with the NGOs Oceana and Skytrif. The initiative operates by transferring data from over 200,000 ships throughout the world to a central website. There, the public can openly observe fishing activities and determine whether or not violations occur in protected zones and comparable locations. The U.S. State Department and the Leonard DiCaprio Foundation are also participants in the program. Efforts to reduce overfishing confront a variety of challenges. The most significant barrier of all is that the majority of the ocean is considered international seas. This means that no single nation can impose its laws there and even implementing international law is fraught with complications like as jurisdiction and international relations. Another impediment is the difficulty of executing national law in territorial waters, particularly in poorer countries. Fishermen are typically from the poorer classes, which governments prefer to treat more leniently. Recreational fishing also permits people to avoid rules designed to prevent or minimize overfishing. Overfishing has even been linked to overpopulation in some nations. Bangladesh and Thailand, in particular, have seen that population growth merely increases food demand. Meanwhile, seafood is an ubiquitous and inexpensive source of food in both countries. As a result, they have both improved their family planning programs, which they have linked to their environmental efforts. Bringing their population growth under control, according to this rationale, would also lessen their environmental footprint, including overfishing. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our channel, since we will be covering a lot of similar content in the future. Till next time, stay curious.